It's been it's been um, a few a few years since I've been gone, and um, for those who have maybe watched watched it earlier and, and saw us, we were starting a new union, maybe some of my kids. But um, as circumstances allowed, um, God gave me the opportunity to be back here in this family, in this house. So I'm very excited that I get the the grace to teach the Word of God once again, and I I really hope that. This word will touch you, that it will, it will connect with you, with your spirit. So we will begin, and the topic, why, I mean, I felt that topic is important, and we're going to talk about offense, we're going to talk about bitterness and unforgiveness, it's the, the tree of it, you know, like the two corners, the sisters, they usually, uh, one invites the other, they always work in that, in the tree of, um, it starts with offense, and then, of course, bitterness shows up, and then unforgiveness is the result. And uh, it, why is it important, I guess, to, for me to, to write this topic is because I've noticed in the experience of deliverance ministry, praying for people, it is actually after they are set free, or at least partially free, the biggest thing how de uh, demons re-enter the body is through that open door of offense. It's, it's so interesting to, to even watch, and uh, it, it was so common that I would even tell people after we were done, I said, um, you're going to go home, and you're going to get a phone call, um, somebody's going to just be mean to you, I mean, or say something, or do something, just to get you offended. Because once you get offended, then you let that fester a little bit, and you get a little bitter, and that opens the door, and then we're back to square one. So we will come back, and we have to do it over again. And it is the most common door that I see uh, demons re-enter after, after uh, maybe some hours of spent, you know, trying to get them out. So there is, Bible is pretty clear on that, so we're going to just gonna, uh, look at uh, God's perspective um, uh, on this, and how it affects us. We're going to talk about uh, later on, on how to avoid it and how to <coughs> just gonna pray those prayers for yourself. And the scripture I'm going to use is Bible, so it's going to be Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to read verse 15, and I'm going to read it and uh, I'm going to explain it, and then I'm going to go down to Mark 11, verse 26. So the, the writer of, of Hebrews, he's, he is writing to the church, and he's saying, looking carefully, now again, the attention is to look carefully, be vigilant, he says, be vigilant, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now, there's a connection between falling short or losing the grace of God and the root of bitterness springing up. So when the root of bitterness springs up and we get offended, something happens, if we're not careful, we can fall short of the grace of God. And that's how people get in trouble with, with those things. Mark eleven twenty six. 26, I'm going to open to that. I'm going to read uh, it's the words of Jesus. I did not write this. But it's very, very direct. He says, but if you do not forgive, obviously somebody has offended you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespass. So forgiveness for our own sins are in the condition, there's a condition that God, or Jesus says, uh, that has to happen. You can't have God forgive your sins, and then you're holding on to, to, to the unforgiveness if uh, you're, you know, somebody around you has done something to you. And the Holy Spirit, He is warning us that to be vigilant. There is danger to lose grace of God in your life. We need the grace of God because it's a supernatural influence in our life that helps us to walk in holiness. Without the grace of God, we cannot walk in holiness. We cannot walk in purity. It is impossible. Outside of grace of God, it, 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 all we really have is, is, is the form of godliness. But with the grace of God, even though we make mistakes, 
there is grace and forgiveness and we can push forward, you know, and we get better and then we are learning. It is very important not to lose it. So, so the Holy Spirit, he's, through the writer of the book of Hebrews, he is telling us to be vigilant. That, that there is a danger of, of falling away from grace through bitterness. Well, the bitterness, it shuts down the grace of God in our lives. Uh, if you have noticed, uh, when we get in an offensive situation, even, I mean, First of all, you lose your peace, and then you notice that anxiety, like all of the negative things starts happening when there's a situation where somebody says something, or whatever, a very contentious situation. We start feeling the negative effects right away. First thing is anxiety. We start to get anxious, and then you probably noticed, um, you know, when, when a situation happens, and you're maybe driving home, and, and in your head, you have all these good comebacks that you didn't have, you know, when that happened. <laughs> so... Yeah, uh, you argue in your own head. Did you notice? You argue with the person in your own head after the thing is done. Mm -hmm. You picture that, how it's, you know, the situation, you kind of bring it back up in your mind, and, and, and then you really try to make a point in your own mind. Mm -hmm. For sure, it affects us. Yeah. It affects us for sure. Now, the Bible says, uh, you know, that uh, there's, there's a, the righteous anger, and uh, it, it's in the Bible that there's some situations where we get angry. It's an emotion. There's nothing wrong with that emotion. In fact, God put it into our soul. God gets angry too. So we get angry. There's something that happens and we get angry. But um, even if we get angry for good reasons, it's called the righteous anger, you know, something we're so, we're so, so indignant. We it's see something that's you know, been happening and we're so getting angry. The Bible tells us not to let the sun set in that condition. You cannot carry that energy overnight. Because if we don't deal with anger in the same day, that emotion, talking about emotion right now, righteous anger, it will turn into offensive bitterness. There's a danger of that. That's why it says in the Bible, I think I believe it's in, in James, that we don't let the sun set when we're angry. We, we try to resolve things, at least with God, with people, within ourselves, before we go to sleep. So it does not grow into that root of bitterness and offense. Well, uh, when we do get into that situation, the root of bitterness, it actually um, says that it, it defiles people around us. Well, how does that happen? I mean, just me angry, just me that got offended and me got upset. How does that root of bitterness, how does that defile other people? Well, what it does and how it defiles people or a community of people that we're a part of, let's just say take a church setting for, for a moment, uh, it's a community of believers, and something happens, an offensive thing happens, somebody said something or did something, uh, all of those things. If it happens, it uh, comes up. What usually happens, you have, it, it grows a little bit in you, you kind of carry it out a little bit, that will get a little deeper, you start getting people on your side. So you go and you share. You go share, you know what they did to me? And, and you share your story, what happened. And so now that other person that had nothing to do with what happened to you, you know, they're sympathizing, and now they're defiled. They're taking your side. They don't even know if it's true, not true. You just told them your side of the story, right? It's not like you go check. And then they go tell, or you, you, know, you tell another person, and before you know it, you have five, 10 people around you, and, and you're trying to get support. This is actually how factions happen in church, because of offense. That's where there's divisions in church. There's groups. Offended people are in groups, you know, one against another, and um, it's so common. And this is why church, in a sense, is powerless because of division. Now, there's power in unity. Holy Spirit is always in unity. So demons, they invite disunity, so there's no power. So we're just, uh, we're in a gathering, and, you know, there's factions. And in the book of Corinthians, Paul addresses, in Corinth, there were factions. And people will take the side of Peter, people take the side of Paul. Some said, well, we're neither, we're Christ, you know, we're even, you know, better, or whatever. Well, that's what happens. Division that causes that, and it defiles people around us. And it can take one incident with one person. 
But if it's not checked, it, it, it involves other people and it defiles the whole group of people. Now, now, not just only one person is involved, now you have multiple people involved in the situation. Well, um, what happens to the person and the place where this is happening, let's say there's people getting the bitterness that kind of defiles people, uh, the grace of God lifts. And what happens to the church or the place, it has, what remains of it actually, is the form of godliness, but there's no more power. Until that thing is resolved, there is no power. So the church, it, it goes through the motions, methodology stays the same, there's worship, there's different things, you know, we do the same stuff, we, we you know, preach the Bible, all the things that we, we're supposed to do, pray, all those things, but there is no power. Why? Because there's a defense, there's divisions. There are demons already working amongst people, dividing them even into sub-units. I mean, they really go, I mean, it's not like just two groups that are against each other. It, it can go into multiple directions. Well, it, uh, well, the root of bitterness uh, that we let kind of happen, it doesn't happen overnight, I mean, it takes us some time to grow. It defiles our own life. And the reason it defiles our own life is because there's demons behind it. it. There's this energy on that. This is why when when this happens, people just can't can't let it go. It's always like a tape playing in their head. Why? Because there's an energy source. There's already there's a place for a demonic spirit to kind of take it farther. And how it takes it farther? If we're not kind of getting to the the, the way it, it works is it draws you mental pictures. Now think of our hearts, actually. It, we, um, or, or how we think where our heart is through imaginations. Now we will get the things we imagine. Why? Because they're out of the realm of the heart. Well, where does faith originate? It originates in the heart, not in your mind. It has to go into your heart mm -hmm. to produce uh, 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 or take the seed and to produce something out of that. It has to go into the soil of your heart. Only that heart soil will take things from the invisible realms and take it to the visible realms, from the supernatural to the natural realm. So people, for instance, that's why we cast down vain imaginations. We, we can't meditate pictures in our minds. Why? Because we will play them out exactly as how we see it. So people want cars, people want houses. They think about it, they visualize it in their minds, they're, they're already living, like it's all in their heart, it's at the heart level, and before you know it, they, they do achieve those things. Why? Because that's where the creative power lays, is within our hearts. So this is why offenses, they're so deep, because when we start playing out things in our, in our imaginations, it's the realm of the heart. And things actually happen, how we see it in our heart, how we see it, and then it's just astounding with accuracy. People don't just fall in sin of sexual morality. It doesn't, doesn't happen. Oh, you know, you're walking, around, you're walking on the street, and I'm like, oops, I kind of fell into sin. It never happens like that. It always happens from imaginations of the heart. Always happens. The seed or the thought is a seed. Word is a seed. It has to fall down. You have to put pictures to it take it deep down, it will produce its own fruit, whether good or bad. So that's why the Bible says, cast down vain imaginations and have good imaginations. So you can do it the other way. You can imagine yourself worshiping God, serving God, all the good things, and then it will come to pass. Well, um, so offense, it opens the door for demonic spirits, and one of the spirits is jealousy, and the other one is revenge. Um, and, and how that happens is when, let's say, there's an offense, and the offended party is, is cultivating all these things, and, and, and now it, it grows to the way where anything good that happens in the person's life that offended us, we get jealous, and we get angry. We want them to fail. 
We don't want to hear the things that happen that are nice and good. We get mad. Now that person might not even know the truth of Abraham. He just messed up his life. He didn't even maybe know that he said something that you know we didn't like or whatever. But there's jealousies now. There's a demon that comes in, and, and we see like, oh man, how can he? You know, how can God bless him? He's you know, and then it just grows and grows, and then anger comes in, and then we want revenge. How we want revenge? Well, we want God to pay him back. Well, we're not gonna say I'm gonna pay him back, right? <laughs> we start praying for things. We start doing witchcraft in a way. We say things. You know, God judge you, God will see, God will do this, God will do that, fire from heaven will come, just you watch, just you see, that's witchcraft. We're starting to curse, or we use different language, but in a sense, that's what it is. We are to bless people, we don't want anything bad to happen to anybody. But this is how it works, that's how it opens the doors. It, all it is is offense. It's just somebody said something, it could come from the simplest, meaningful, like meaningless things, but it can grow into that. And of course, um, the worst of it is that when it goes deeper, when the offense grows and, and bitterness and the anger grows, what happens, it invites the spirit of unforgiveness. Now, this is where the danger lies because our forgiveness, we just read, Jesus said, depends how we forgive others. I mean, it is re related to that. Um, and so what happens when we hold on forgiveness, the blood of Jesus stops working for us to cover our sins throughout the day. We mm -hmm. sin every day. We just not, might not realize it, but I mean, in thought indeed, we, it's on a subconscious level. We make decisions that, that are not pleasing to God all the time. And, and the privilege of being born again is that the Spirit of Christ lives in us and His blood, His holy blood, functions to cleanse us all the time if we abide in Him. He washes us clean all the time. That's why if you take the Old Covenant, you know, you touch something dead, you get defiled. Why? There is no working blood. You had to go through a process. There was a process where you have to go get, you know, there's a sacrifice that was made and the, the, the red heifer had to be burned, and then you take, you know, what's left of it, mix it with water, and then you kind of cleanse your body in that way from uncleanness. But in this covenant, the Christ, the Holy Spirit, lives in us, the Spirit of Christ, and the blood of Jesus, it works in our spirit to cleanse us. So that's why we don't get defiled if we, you know, touch something or eat something, like you eat bacon, you don't get defiled. It's a, I believe it's a working of the blood of Jesus. He cleanses us all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if we walk in unforgiveness? Well, that shuts down for us. Because for us to be forgiven and cleansed from our own sins, we have to forgive people that have offended us, that have done something hurtful to us. Now, people, when uh, they get into that, um, you know, uh, some kind of, trouble or spiritual issues, they seek help in prayer, in deliverance prayer. So they sign up to deliverance prayer. There's only one problem, that uh, deliverance cannot happen because the premise of the deliverance prayer is unforgiveness of our own sin. Now, you have to take out the legal right of demon to affect you or be there. And the way that happens is when we repent of our sins and He forgives us for those sins. That takes out the legal rights. And that's why we evict demonic spirit, because there is no legal right to be there. The door is closed. Well, if we walk in unforgiveness, or we hold unforgiveness, it shuts that down. It shuts down the deliverance ministry, because demons aren't going nowhere, because they can't be in forgiveness of sins, because we're holding other people's sins against us. So it shuts down deliverance. And not only that, with unforgiveness, there comes torment. People that walk in unforgiveness, they actually are in, internally tormented. Tormented. There's torment, tormented that come. And if you think of it, it's like an internal prison where people, and even the offend, whoever offended them doesn't, might not even know that there's anything wrong, that they did anything wrong. But the person that holds that is actually tormented by those demonic spirits. They come in, it opens up the torment. Now, Jesus gave a really beautiful story uh, to illustrate this because the question is in Matthew 18 uh, verse 21 
is, uh, or, the, or the, the story Jesus tells in the proverb is in the response or to the question that Peter asks. And he asks Jesus' question how many times he should forgive his brother that sins against him. Is it, the, is it, is it the seven times? I mean, what's the number, Jesus? Says, Give me a number, and then after that number, you know, my brother is so annoying me, I'm, I'm going to start forgiving him. So, Jesus' response, he wants to illustrate a picture how the kingdom of heaven operates in the, in, in this, in the subject of forgiveness and, un, and holding unforgiveness. So, he tells him a story, and, or answers Peter with a story. Well, he says, there was a king. There was a king, and uh, to him, they, they, they brought a person, because he wanted to, you know, uh, there was an account that uh, a person had, a debt, that the king wanted settled. So they bring this guy to, to the king, and that guy owed him 10,000 talents, gold or silver, not just to give you, that's weight, 10,000 talents is, is a weight of gold. Mm -hmm. If you take that weight of gold, of, of a talent, and you translate it to dollars, that's two billion dollars. So this guy is brought to this king, a debtor. He owes the king two billion dollars. And the the reason that the debt Jesus kind of points out that, that ridiculous amount of debt, nobody can even borrow that much. Like, well, like ten thousand talents, how could that guy even borrow that much? It's it's impossible. Well, the reason Jesus kind of gives that number is to make a point that the guy cannot pay it back. That's the point. It's so much. He can never pay it back. So what happens then? Um, so he comes and he owns that much money. So the king tells his servants to go and sell the guy's stuff. Said, okay, liquidation time. Sell his stuff, whatever he owns sell his wife and children into slavery and pay back the debt. The only problem is, even if, he's, if, if they sold his wife, his children, and everything, it was not even going to matter. There's no way he could repay that <coughs> much money. It was, it was impossible. Worst of all, now he understood that, that his actions, how he lost the money, who knows? I mean, that's not the point. Now, he, now, back then, slavery, it's not like we think, oh, slavery, that, you know, what, is she going to be like a maid in somebody's house? No, that's terrible. Back in the day, slavery was not nice. Uh, now you look at, you know, all these uh, places where there's human traffic. I mean, slavery is a terrible place. He understands that his <coughs> wife and children are going to be probably treated or really badly, mistreated really badly. And that's not, and, and, and him himself can't even... That's not going to solve his problem. So he falls on his knees. And he starts begging. So he begs the king. And he's begging the king that he would forgive. Like, just to have mercy on him. He's begging him. Well, the king had compassion. He was moved by compassion. So he looks at this guy. And he like just forgives him. He says, you know what? I'm going to clear all of your debts. Just going to forgive him. I mean, that, talk about mercy, <clears throat> extravagant mercy, $2 billion, said, I'm going to not count it against you. I mean, can you imagine the guy's life changed in that one moment that the king forgave him everything. He can go back to his family. He could get his life back together. Uh, you know, he is completely forgiven. The amount that he knew he could never pay back. So what does that guy do? He just keeps going. Well, he finds a fellow servant. He finds a business partner. Somebody that he was working with, probably dealing with, and he owed him. There was a debt that his friend or a business partner, whoever it was, owed him 100 denarius. Now, that's about, if you count wages, the, the wage back then was one denarius a day, let's say three months of work, let's say $12,000. That's the amount. Okay, $12,000, his his friend or whoever he was owed him. So he comes and he says, give me back my money. Well, now he's kind of in the place of the king. And his friend falls down on his knees. And he's begging. He says, give me a little bit more time. I'll pay you back. I promise I will 
put some switch, I will do whatever it takes, I will probably pay you back. I'm almost not there. I mean, it was reasonable. But what does that guy do? He says, no. In fact, he did it publicly. People are watching the scene unfold. The guy's begging on his knees. And people are watching what's happening. It's public. It's displayed. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. And that guy's on his knees begging for mercy. He says, no. And he puts him in, a, in, in prison for debtors. debtors. They don't have that right now. But back then, I mean, if you couldn't pay, you, you go to prison so you pay back what you owe. So he throws him in there. So he pays him you know, that amount, $4,000 or 100 dinars. Now, people that were watching the scene, because it's a public scene, they get so sad for that guy. They get really worked up. That's, this is injustice. This is, I mean, they knew what happened to that guy. It was probably on the news that, you know, the king forgave him $2 billion, dollars and you know, it probably was a tabloid. Everyone, <laughs> but it was, everybody knew about that. And they're like, it was just so bad. So they go to the king and they tell the story to the king. Say, this is what happened. So the king calls them back and he calls them, you wicked servant. Immediately, he calls them wicked. That what he did was wickedness. Like, it wasn't just like, oh, you know what? You should not say, you wicked. He called it wickedness. He said, I forgave you all of that debt, a lot of money. Couldn't you forgive your fellow servant a little bit of money? Mm -hmm. And this is important. And the king gets angry. Now, he called him wicked. And now, emotion, emotional response of the king is anger. Because of what that guy did in that situation. So, what he does to the guy, he, he takes that wicked servant and he tells his servants to throw him into prison. Not only that, he has to pay back everything. Mm -hmm. And that he would do that, he puts tormentors to help him. <clears throat> so that guy is thrown into prison and there's tormentors that are torturing him every day until he pays back. So Jesus concludes this story, illustration, with these words that you were not going to hear a lot preached. He says, this is how my father will treat you or deal with you if you don't forgive your brothers from your, all of your heart. Sorry, Jesus, did you just say that? <laughs> yes, he did. He just said that. That my father will do the same to you. <coughs> There's going to be some tormentors coming your way. If you don't forgive, a person transgressing against you, with not just forgive him like oh, I for, with all of your heart. He, he marks it out. If you read in Matthew, it's all of your heart. It has to be repentant. It has to be out of your heart. Not just like, no, I'm just going to say it. No, it has to be out of your heart. And so we see this illustration and the spiritual significance of it. I mean, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story with pictures. And of course, if you want to see the role, you know, uh, to understand what Jesus was, was, was trying to say, or we get it that the king in that storyline is representative of God, our Father. Mm -hmm. And the wicked or the, the servant that whom you know God forgave so much is us sinners. I mean, our sins. We can't we can't uh, pay money for forgiveness. There's nothing we can do. Work, no matter work, anything to get our sins forgiven. There's nothing. You cannot equate. You know, if you do, you know, nicer thing, you know, like good things, and then they'll kind of overbalance the bad things. It doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. The only way that the sins can be satisfied or, or, the, or transgression, as far as the rationale of God is concerned, that can be satisfied is you have to die. Mm -hmm. Or somebody else has to take your place. They didn't do anything. 
take all of your all of your guilt and blame on himself so that the way the righteousness of God can be satisfied and then you can receive forgiveness. Well, in this case, we know that Jesus shed his royal blood. It wasn't just like, oh, you know what, Jesus, we kind of trivialize the cross, trivialize Jesus dying for our sins, you know, we go to Sunday school. And so, I mean, if you think about it, Jesus became human. Oh, God became human. His son became human, and he shed his royal blood. This was the only way to receive forgiveness for our sins. It was a big deal. Jesus had to go through all the torment, all the betrayal, all of the things that we ask for forgiveness for, he had to go through himself to qualify. Because he had to take our sins, well, then he had to feel the full wrath and the full ravages of that on his own body, his torn body. So Jesus shed his royal blood. So God takes that serious. It cost him a lot. A lot. And so, when we, of course, we understand that uh, the, the, you know, in the story, that the friend is, is somebody, our peer, who, you know, who we interact with, if their transgression against us, as far as God sees that in that story, is, is very tempting. All you have to do is just say, you know what, I'm really sorry that I've said that, or, or you said it to me, it hurt me, but I forgive you. Like, it doesn't take much. To make it right does not make much. But you'd be surprised how people hold on to unforgiveness. <laughs> you'd be surprised. And God calls it wickedness. Mm -hmm. And it elicits his response. He gets angry. So we come to church, you know, we pray, we worship the Lord, and if there's unforgiveness in our heart, God is not glad when he feels it. Because we're holding other people's sins against us. And he wants us to resolve this. Well, let's, you know, let's kind of talk about, or kind of finish the story off with these three things. To just kind of remind us. That offense and bitterness, or the root of bitterness, if we let it, it has tremendous spiritual uh, significance in our life, in our walk with God. Tremendous. I mean, it will, it will really derail you in the walk with the, with the Lord, for sure, for sure. If we don't, if we, uh, you know, the, the offense and the bitterness, if we don't deal with it, it will open the door to unforgiveness. You can be sure of it. You cannot let it alone. You cannot let it grow and faster and put pictures to that, to the conversations. In, like we do it in our heart. We cannot do that because that's how it grows. That's how it intensifies. Well, it opens the door to demonic forces, for sure. That's how people get demonized. Have you seen people that walk in unforgiveness? Look at their life. Look at their face. Their demeanor. Their anger. Mm -hmm. They're never happy. <laughs> and you can almost know they're tormented. There's unforgiveness. They're, they're walking in unforgiveness. Even people that don't even maybe per se know God or but if they just choose, like, you know what, I'm going to make things right, and they just forgive people that have, you know, there's recovery programs, not everything is Christ-based, but people, if they make right decisions, and they make things right with people, their countenance brightens. Their life at least changes. There's something's happening that's positive when we let go of other people's things against us. Well, unforgiveness will, will close heaven for us. Um, you know, when we pray, if we have people in our lives that we are just cannot forgive, I mean, and we rationalize it, oh, if you only knew what he did to me, or she did to me, if you only knew, if you only knew, if you only knew, and, and they rationalize it, and they're like, but it keeps them in bondage. It doesn't solve anything. It doesn't solve anything. So the way out is for our restoration. And so that we would walk in grace. <coughs> so that God would hear our prayers. So that would be supernatural mm -hmm. move of God in our life to help us walk in humility, purity, holiness, all those things. We must. We must. When we pray, and Jesus says, when you pray, if there's somebody or something happened, bring it up before God. 
Say, Lord, this is what happened. This is how it made me feel. You have to be transparent. And that's how I lead people in prayer. You have to tell God how it made you feel. And usually tears come. Because when you do that, you open your heart up to God for healing. Usually people have a hard time saying what they did and how they made it feel. But when they overstep that and they open their heart, and, and they, the reason they do that because there's pain there, and I understand. And there is this heart pain behind that. But when they do that, then you are going <coughs> through prayer, and with their own mouth, they say, I forgive that person for this, mm -hmm. this, and that. And I let him go, and I ask the blood of Jesus to wash my heart from that. And I release them in the name of Jesus. I bless them. You have to bless them to say those things. And then you have to break agreement to the demonic spirits that are already there, the tormentors, because they're still there. You have to evict them. Because they'll, they'll start giving you pictures. They're going to give you, you're going to go home, and, and if you don't evict them, they're going to give you all these thoughts, that, that, and, and, and the feelings will come back, and, and all, the, all those emotions, negative emotions. You have to evict them. You have to break your agreement with them. And you have to say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. You have to say it. I don't want you anymore in my life. And they will go. And they will go. Again, repentance, all we do is we ask God to forgive us. That takes out the legal right. Breaking agreements or renunciations, or sometimes you can use the word rejection. It says, in the name of Jesus, I renounce or I reject the demonic spirit of unforgiveness, of anger, of jealousy. Whatever, because you know, because the fruit is always identified by the root. And you know the fruit, because you can, they're manifesting in your lives. Mm -hmm. So by what's manifesting, you can find what type of demon is operating. And then you say, in the name of Jesus, I want you to be gone. And you just fell into a pack, the pack sand, get out, just get out. When you do that, they will leave. You have to enforce. Once they have no legal rights, and then you enforce the rights as a child of God, the authority given to us by God, he will have to go. It might be, you know, a little battle. There, there, there might be, uh, not everybody, you know, um, usually, usually, again, in experience, it doesn't have to be with everybody, but what I've noticed, and if I can share that, in a, in a deliverance ministry, I have noticed, now, I did not know that when we started here at Seven Bells, it was, uh, we were learning. I mean, a lot of what I thought I knew kind of went out of the window with Lauren. <laughs> She's sitting right here. She's smiling now. Um, because, you know, you read some books and you think you know what you're doing. You know, and then you get disappointed the first time you pray for somebody. Um, and again, you know, and, and, you know, you pray and, and there's a little bit of result. And like, okay, this is it. Perfect. Great. Things are going to be different. And you only just cast out one and there's like 35 left, you know. <laughs> But, but the person feels better. I mean, it's a little lighter. Like, so how do you feel? Like, a little lighter. I'm like, oh, cool. All right. Cool. Now, yeah. just come to read your Bible one hour a day. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, but, and then what happened is, is, is another one would show up right next to it. And then the person like, I have these same things coming back. I was like, what's going on? So I'm like, what is going on? And so from experience, I guess, uh, we, uh, I've learned that there are groups. They unpack in layers. So once I understood that there are layers and it's a process, it made things easier because then I would tell a person, this is going to take a few times, so don't be surprised. We'll do the first layer, today, whatever, we'll disattach and leave. Then I'll give you your homework, I'll always do the homework, and then you come back because sure enough, another layer will break out and you'll feel it and it's in your emotions, it's, you'll know. You'll come back, you're going to get worse, which is good news, actually. <laughs> and getting worse is good because the layer just came out, so that means they're going to go. If they're deep down there, they're not budging. And then layer after layer, some people would pray four, five, six times, depending on the amount and on how deep things are. And sometimes it's generational that you have to deal with and all those things. And you don't know that when you start. So what I'm saying is when people are seeking or somebody's struggling with unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, jealousies, keep in mind that when, when you're praying and when you're telling to, you're casting them out, it's a process. You have to do it all the time, every day, in your prayer time. You have to break your agreements with them. You have to tell them to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, I count them out. You know, spirit of jealousy number one, spirit of jealousy number two, number three, because I know they're more than just one. 
it's their function, but you can have good 40, 50, 100 samples or even more. Mm -hmm. And then you tell them to unpack. Once they start unpacking, the, the main guy, the strong man, gets weaker and weaker and weaker mm -hmm. and weaker. And then over time, then the, then the last one usually is the last to go, is the main, main strong man. So that's kind of quick uh, teaching and deliverance <laughs> with that. Um, <clears throat> I think that's it. I mean, we understand. The uh, Bible's pretty clear. I'm, I'm, now you understand why churches have trouble walking in, in, in the grace of God with um, people being saved, and miracles, healings, and all those things happening all the time. I know it happens, and we're happy about that, but it's not at the level that it happened in the first church, for sure. We can mm -hmm. at least say that. Mm -hmm. Which means we're not walking in the fullness of what God has for us. And again, it is division. How did Jerusalem church fare when there were divisions between Gentiles and Jewish people? Well, we read, and it doesn't end too well. The only church with all the apostles, uh, the Jerusalem church lasted 40 years because of, you know, there were divisions between Jewish and Gentile believers and so on and so forth, and different things like that. So God is the God of unity. He calls us to unity. And so... I want to encourage everybody to really do that introspection. If you feel like the heaven is closed, it's hard to pray, or there's torment inside, um, most likely there's areas of hurt that's been undealt, so there's a pain, and then there's actually unforgiveness is what's holding that all together. And if that gets broken, then, then a lot of things can change. So I'm going to end with this. bless you. We'll pray, and then we'll close with prayer. Mm -hmm. Father God, I'm just so thankful, Lord, for you are truly merciful, God. You deal with us justly, God. You forgive us, Lord, for, or you even pay us way more than we deserve, God. You are so good to us. You are so kind and so merciful, Father. So I thank you. I thank you, Lord. I ask that you would seal this word in our heart, God. Let it grow, that seeds that have been, that have been shared, words of God would come deep into our hearts and bring forth 34, 60, 40, and 100 fold in our hearts. Amen. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You are our Lord. Jesus, yes. you are our Lord. Yes, thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us out of your word. We love you. The Spirit of Jesus, we love you. You are our comfort. Yes. And we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.